And if you have your Bibles tonight, we're going to be in Exodus. We're going to find ourselves back in Exodus. And the uh, Lord is leading me over here to the Ten Commandments. We've looked at Thou Shall Not Covet. we looked at uh, the path that leads to adultery. And now we're looking at uh, verse number 8. The Sabbath day, Sunday. Why is Sunday such a special day in the Word of God? Why do we worship on Sunday rather than on Saturday? Why don't we worship any other day of the week? You know, what is significant about Sunday? And that's what we want to look at, and that's what we want to go through tonight. And uh, as you're turning there to Exodus chapter 20, I came across this list that says, some signs that you're getting older. So I was like, well, let me see if I'm getting older, all right? It says, everything hurts, and what doesn't hurt uh, doesn't work. <laughs> the gleam in your eyes from the sun hitting your bifocals, amen? Let's see, uh, you feel like the morning after and you haven't been anywhere. Your little black book contains only names that end in MD. Boy, yes indeed. Uh, let's see, uh, you look forward to a dull evening. Amen? Yes indeed, it says, there was, where's, there was one in here that was funny. So your knees buckle and your belt won't. Right? Boy, oh boy. Uh, let's see, the little... The little gray hair lady that you helped across the street is your wife. Boy. All right. I better stop you before I get in trouble. Amen? Man, oh man. All right. Well, let's look into God's Word and see why Sunday is this not just another day. Sunday is a special day to the Lord. And uh, also we want to look at the spirit of the, the, the word Sabbath and what it really means and the heart of worship. But the Bible does say in Exodus chapter 20, in God's infallible, holy, inerrant word, verse number 7 says this. Uh, verse number 8 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do any work, thou nor thy son or daughter or manservant, nor thy maidservant, or thy cattle, or thy stranger that is within thy gates. So they were to do no work. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Now guys, verse 11, and there's other verses that prove when it comes to God making the heavens and the earth in six days, it was literal 24-hour days. And this verse right here proves that because he is in connection with it says, um, and rested on the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And so he's referring to literal days, and God has set a pattern for us. So let's go to the Lord and ask his blessing upon this time, and let's learn the importance of Sunday and what this verse really means. And Jesus, we just come to you once again. Father, we just want to come to you in the name of Jesus and say, Lord, thank you for the privilege of access to your throne. I pray now, Lord, that you would help me and do in me and through me what I cannot muster on my own. I pray for your anointing. Lord, I just truly pray that you'll open up our hearts and minds to receive and understand your word. But Lord, I just truly pray that this would be a reminder, a refresher to our hearts, Lord, to give the balance that we need in our lives when it comes to this commandment and, Lord, what it means. So, Father, I pray that you'll help me to be able to do that very thing. If there's one loss tonight. I pray that this would be the night that they would be willing to acknowledge their sin, that they cannot save themselves, that, Lord, they would turn from sin and self and they would put all their trust in you, Jesus, calling upon your name, believing in their hearts you died for them, believing in their hearts that you were raised from the dead, and that, Lord, you tell us in your word, all those that call upon your name shall be saved. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why Sundays? Well, first of all, and looking at this, it's not so much the day. Now, to the Jews, it was looking at the day. But now we are in the New Testament, and we want to look at the principle also of this commandment. But this commandment primarily deals with worshiping God and the neglect of it. And we can sometimes neglect our worship, neglect our fellowship, neglect the closeness that we have with the Lord, and the time that we spend with Him in prayer, the time that we spend with Him in His Word. And sometimes, if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves going through the motions, but yet without our heart. You know, if I were to come home and I were, uh, let's say, accustomed to forgetting, giving my wife something for her birthday or for some special occasion, and, and I finally remember and I come home and I got flowers and I give her flowers and chocolate and she's just elated, and then I look at my wife and say, 
I just want you to know that's my duty to do that. She probably hit me upside the head with them flowers. Amen? You can have your flowers back, brother. I'm not your job. Amen? I want you to do it because of what? Your heart's in it. Amen? Now, guys, there's some things that we do have a sense of duty, but God wants our devotion. God wants our heart before he wants our service. And this commandment deals with the worship of the Lord and the neglect of it. God gave a command to us that we're to worship him and serve him only, according to the book of Matthew. Uh, the Bible says that we're to worship him in spirit and in truth. So in other words, God says, I want you to worship me sincerely, not, real, not, not from a ritualistic viewpoint or standpoint. I want your heart to be in it. Amen? And God knows whether or not your heart is in into him or it's not. Or you're enamored with something else. It might be a hobby. It might be a person. It might be a thing other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. God also says that we're to do it steadfastly. Every day, every moment that you're saved, every second that you're awake, we are worshiping God. Amen? Our lives are an act of worship to the Lord. But the Bible says that we're to take one day of rest to rest our body, to rest our emotions, to rest our spirit, to rest our soul, and worship the Lord. Now this commandment deals with three things. Three things, and these three things are this. It deals with labor, it deals with leisure, and it deals with worship, and the balance of worshiping the Lord as we're laboring, and at the same time while we take leisure. And so God wants us to have that balance because the Word of God teaches labor and leisure and these verses all in the perspective of worshiping the Lord. Now, we no longer keep the Sabbath day. All nine commandments out of the Ten Commandments were carried over to the New Testament. But this commandment, remembering the Sabbath day, was not carried over, but the principle of this commandment was carried over. And that's what we want to focus on, and that's what we want to learn. You see, the Sabbath in the Old Testament was Saturday for the Jews. Now, an Orthodox Jew, they will not serve hot food on the Sabbath, which is their Saturday. Uh, a Jew's business will shut down on Saturday, their Sabbath. You know, people love to serve the letter of the law, but sometimes they neglect and forget the spirit of the law. Now, I've heard people in this country say, hey, listen, we're not going to cook, we're not going to do anything on on Sunday. And that's fine, but they'll go to a restaurant and let somebody serve and cook and do all that for them too. So, you know, a lot of people get wrapped up in thinking that, hey, you can't cut your grass, you can't do this, you can't do that on Sunday, but we're going to look at the spirit of what this really means as we move through this. But we do honor the principle because the principle is very laid out and very clear to us in Scripture. Now, one day is to be set aside to worship God is still valid, but a lot of people still ignore this principle. I like what George Washington said concerning the Sabbath or Sunday. He said this, I order that the troops may have an opportunity of being able to attend public worship. Therefore, the generals excuse them from fatigue duty on Sundays. He understood the principle of setting aside time to rest your heart, to rest your mind, to rest your soul, to focus on the Lord. Amen? Now, this commandment was given, first of all, to, to the family. It was given to the individual, but it was also given to the nation. Now, I like what this one man said. He said this, Any individual, family or nation, that will not honor God one day out of the week has no right to expect the blessings of God any other day of the week. Amen? The Word of God does say... God honors those that honor Him. So if you don't take time out to take a shower, you're going to what? <laughs> Amen. Let's just say it. You're going to stink. Amen? So you've got to honor the fact that, hey, a bath or a shower does you a lot of good. Amen? Well, spiritually, we need that bath. We need that time set apart so that our souls can be refreshed, so that we can have that time in the presence of the Lord. You know, if you don't put gas in your car, guess what? You're not going to go very far, amen? We need time to refuel. We need time to retank and to make sure that we have the balance in our life of honoring the Lord between the labor that we do and the leisure that we take. Now, a man named William Gladstone, who was the Prime Minister of England, said this. I thought this would be interesting. He said this, You tell me 
what the young people of England are doing on Sunday morning, and I will tell you what the future of England will be. Now, statistics show that 2% right now, 2% of the population of England goes to church today. Wow, 98% of the English men and women do not attend church and, and England today is a shell, a mere shell of what she formerly was. You know, you had uh, great people coming out of England. You had Charles Haddon Spurgeon that God used to win thousands and thousands of people to the Lord. And now 2% of that population even attends church. Wow. So the principle of the Sabbath day reminds us of three great works of God. Now what we want to do is we want to look at the work of the Father, we want to work at the work of the Son, and we want to look at the work of God the Holy Spirit. Now we serve one God and three persons who are co-equal, co-eternal, amen? But, but, but one God, one Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, amen? But we want to look at the work that God has done. Now two of the works that are great works of God are rested from. But there's one work that God has done that you and I rest in. So two of his works we, God has rested from, but one of the works he's doing and has done is the work that we rest in. And we want to look at that, that right there. So God the Father rested from his first work of creation. Now guys, when I say God the Father, of course, Jesus Christ was there, the Holy Spirit was there, the Bible says in the beginning, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God, and not one thing was made without Him. The Bible says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we know that the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit were there, but in the Old Testament, it, it, it shows God the Father more than it shows God the Son or God the Holy Spirit. In the Gospels, we see God the Son, but in the New Testament, we see a lot of God the Holy Spirit, but it's all the same God. Are you with me? So I want to break it down by looking at God the Father rested from his first great work, which was creation. Jesus Christ, God the Son, rested from the second great work, and that was the work of Calvary, and that was for our salvation. Amen? And that work has been complete. But you and I are to rest in God's third work, his redemption and his regeneration, which is a new creation. So he is constantly making us into the image of Christ day by day, according to the book of Corinthians. He's conforming us into the image of the Lord every day that goes by. The Bible says in Philippians 1, 6, He who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. So God rested from his labors, and so we also are to rest from our physical labors too. Are you with me? Now, don't forget, two parts of this, uh, of this commandment are work and worship. So let's look at that side of it first. Rest and work, and then also time out from work. So let's consider God's work, God the Father's work in creation concerning the Sabbath day. Look at verse 11 now. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and the sea and all that is in them, and rested... On the Sabbath day. Now that word rest literally means finish. God doesn't get tired like we get tired. God doesn't need rest. God doesn't sleep. But the word rest literally means to finish. So he finished his work on the Sabbath day, the seventh day. And God blessed it and hallowed it. Now, in Genesis 1-1, we see God working. All that we see on a daily basis, all the creation that we experience on a daily basis is the work of his mighty hand in creating all that there is invisible or visible in six days. Are you with me? So God sets the standard. God is the ultimate standard for everything. Amen? Yeah. Listen, the word of God is the ultimate standard. If it, anything goes against this book, then it's false. It's to be rejected. Reality is whatever God says. Amen? And this is reality, God's truth. So he is the one who sets the pace. He is the one who sets the tone. He is the author and finisher of our life. And so he is the standard. Well, God finished. God rested from his work. So most people think that to go to work is an evil thing. A lot of people think that work was created because of sin. But guys, that's not true. Most people think that work was a result of Adam's sin in the garden, but that's not because of sin. How do I know that? 
Now, work did become more grievous. Work did become to the point where he had to sweat from his brow, the Bible says, but that came because of the curse. So work did get a lot more harder, if you will. But Genesis 2.15 says this, before the fall, now listen, God put Adam in the garden to tend. That word tend means to work it and to keep it. He was to take care of it. So God gave him an assignment. God gave him work to do, and that was to tend to the garden. So work was something that God existed before the fall. It didn't happen uh, after the fall. So God wanted Adam to learn the same thing that he's trying to teach us tonight. And what is that, brother? That if you'll take care of the garden that God's given you, if you'll take care of your wife, you'll take care of your husband, you'll take care of your kids, you'll take care of your household, you'll take care of your family, you take care of your affairs the way God wants you to, God also promises he'll take care of you. Amen? Now, God's going to take care of you whether or not you take care of yourself. That's the God that we serve, but God honors those that honor him. Amen? Now, there is nothing wicked about work. Now, you ask some teenagers, they'll, they'll disagree with you. Amen? They'll say, brother, work is wicked, man. It's wicked. There's nothing lovely either, though, about laziness. Amen? So work is not wicked, but laziness is not lovely. So we have to have a balance. Are you with me? Okay. Yes, indeed. Now, the Bible gives us a definition. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 9, listen to this. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work. You see the word your there? Don't miss it now. God's given each of us a work that he wants you personally to do. Now, the Bible says that the word of God came to Jonah. Then the Bible says that the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And God gave him a specific assignment, a specific work to do. God has also given you a specific gift, and he's given you an assignment and a work to do. For the Christians as a whole, he's given us the assignment of sharing the gospel with the law so they don't go to hell. Amen? But God's given you a gift. God has called you to do a certain work for him. Now, we are not here to waste space. Amen? We are not here to smooch off everybody else. We are here to be productive according to the word of God. We are to make better lives for ourselves, and that's fine. But we're also to be used of God. The gifts of God that God's given us are not toys. They are tools, as Adrian Rogers said. And they're to be used to serve the body of Christ. Amen? To be a benefit, to be a blessing to other people. So we are working to serve the Lord by serving one another as well. Now, the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, If a man or a woman will not work, let him die. Literally, that's, that's basically what God is saying. Don't let him eat. And so if a man doesn't eat, ultimately he's going to what? He's going to die. Boy. So God says, listen, if a man will not work, let him die. But listen, if a man genuinely can't work because of a disability, then we need to do all that we can to help those people. Amen? But on the other hand, if a man can uh, go to work and, and work, then he needs to do that, the Word of God says. Listen to what Proverbs 16, 26 says. The person who labors, labors for himself, for his hungry mouth does drive him on. Amen? Now, if there was ever a commandment to be obeyed, it's eating. Amen? <laughs> Especially Baptists, right? Yes, indeed. Now, look at verse 11. It says, for in six days... The Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested, or finished his work, on the seventh day. So God not only sets the example of work, because God did work. He worked for six days, creating everything that we see and we don't see. So he gives us an example. So we need to work, because God does. Amen? But God also sets the example of rest and leisure, if you will, as well. God did not rest because he was fatigued. God rested because he was finished. I want to make that very clear. But the principle filters down to us and the sense of leisure or rest. Now, if rest wasn't too good for God, then rest shouldn't be too good for you and I either. Amen? Are you with me? I heard one preacher say concerning workaholics, you're in trouble when the sign on your boss's door says, thank God it's Monday. Amen? Boy, oh boy. Now, verse 8 says, remember to keep the Sabbath day Holy. That word holy there means to set apart. So we're to set apart at least one day to worship and honor the Lord. 
Now God says we can, in six days, we could cut the grass, we can trim the bushes, we can wash the car, we can get whatever needs to get done, done. He gives us six days to do that. But then he says we're to take one day out of the week and sanctify it, set it apart for the worship and the honor of God. So you and I are to rest our bodies, we're to rejuvenate our souls and our spirit while we're focusing on the Lord. Now look at verse 8. It does not say remember the Sabbath morning. What does it say, church? Amen. Amen. So it's not just a holy day, but it's the whole day. Amen. We're to do it all day, the whole day. Now, in the Old Testament, it's called the Sabbath. That would be Saturday. But in the New Testament, it's now called the Lord's Day. Are you with me? Old Testament, it's called the Sabbath Day. In the New Testament, it's called the Lord's Day. That, that's key. So God tells us to set aside at least one day a week for Him, just like you set aside a dime out of every dollar, that basic principle were to follow. Now listen, God can do more in six days with your labor than he can in the seven that you don't rest. Do you, do you believe that? Amen? God can do more in five seconds if he wanted to, but listen, God wants you to honor the pattern that he set. There's a reason for that, amen? You know, we're under authority. There's God, and then the Bible says when it comes to a household, God is holding husbands responsible for how that household is run. Whether they like that responsibility or not, they're going to give an account to the Lord for how they run their household. And then we have the wife, and then we have the children. But if the children want to rule the house, and we allow them to do that, it's going to equal what? Chaos. Amen? So there's a rhyme, and there's a pattern that we have to follow, and we have to follow the Lord's example. Now listen to this. This is interesting. Listen. A doctor said this, and I quote, You lose more oxygen... In a day's work, then you can recover in a night's rest. Okay, so you lose more oxygen than you can recover in a full night's rest. But listen to this. But he also discovered that if a person would take one complete day of rest, the body would recover enough oxygen to replenish the body for a whole week. Isn't that interesting? Wow. God says if you'll rest all day, the whole day, He'll give you what you need. That's not a coincidence in my book. Amen? Listen, a car needs its oil change every three to 5,000 miles. What happens if you don't do it? I mean, you might look, might be looking for a new engine or a different car. Amen? God says don't be a workaholic, but at the same time, he says, listen, you need to take time out for me. You need to take time out for your family. You need to take time out for your friends. You need to take time out to honor and worship me. You know, there was an employee, an employer that told a Christian who was working for him that he had to start working on Sunday. Well, the Christian said he couldn't. The employer said, well, now listen, didn't Jesus say if an ox fell into a ditch to help him out? Yes, sir, the employee said. He goes, but if I had an ox that fell into a ditch every Sunday, I'd either kill the ox or fill in the ditch. Amen? <laughs> Amen. If you keep your nose to the grind seven days a week, it won't be long that you won't be able to smell the sweet things in life. You know, guys, a lot of people do get obsessed with work, 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 work. There's another group that gets obsessed with leisure, 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 leisure. And God is saying, listen, in and of themselves, they're not evil, but man, things can happen if you get out of balance and they can become a snare. It can become a sin in your life. You know, there's nothing wrong with sleeping. But if you sleep in every day, 12 hours a day, that's going to ultimately turn into what? Laziness, amen? And laziness, according to the scripture, is a sin. So we have to have God's balance. Absolutely, God's balance. So, God worked and God finished. God rested. God says to us that we are to work and we are also to rest to honor Him. Amen? Now, so that's God's work of creation. But now let's move on. Let's look at... God the Son. Let's look at the Lord's work of salvation concerning the Sabbath day. All right? God purposed in his heart to rest forever and ever. He did. But sin interrupted the plan of God, and God had to go back to work once again. After he created everything that we see and not that we know, sin came into the garden, interrupted that plan, and God had to go back to work. And the Bible tells us in, in John chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus said, My Father has been working until now, and I have been working. 
And now this is the work that Jesus is going to do for the whole world for salvation. Now the Sabbath was not only a practice to be followed in the Old Testament, but it was also a prophecy to be fulfilled by Christ himself. The Bible says that that, 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 one, that one law would pass away, but that all would be fulfilled. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Well, there's a picture here of salvation. There's a picture here in the Sabbath day. There's a reason why God told them that he didn't want them picking up sticks. He didn't want them doing anything on Saturday, which was the Jewish Sabbath. And we're going to answer that question as we move through this. Are you with me? Am I going too fast? All right. So, John chapter 17, verse 4 says this. I have finished the work which you have given me to do, which was salvation. So God rested and finished his work of creation. Christ rested after his finished work of salvation. And what work was that? He was crucified. He was buried. He, was, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and he is sitting down at the right hand of God. Now the Bible says... In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12, But this man Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice forever for sins, sat down at the right hand of God. Now why is that important? Why is it important that the Bible says that Jesus sat down at the right hand of God? His work was finished. Amen? You see, in the tabernacle, and then also in the temple, the one piece of furniture that you did not see was a chair. Because the work of the priest was never done. But Jesus Christ being our high priest, Jesus Christ being the perfect one, not only took our sin, but also removed our sin forever completely. Amen? So therefore, there was a throne in heaven that he could sit down and signify to us that the work of salvation is done, done, done. All you have to do is put your trust in that. Amen? Amen. Now, there are religious groups out there uh, one of them being the seven day Adventist, and now I'm not picking on them personally, but they say that if you don't worship on Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, that you and I are breaking the fourth commandment. Is that true, Brother Dave? Are we breaking the fourth commandment because we don't worship or set aside Saturday, but we set aside Sunday? Is that correct? Is that true? Well, in Colossians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said this, Jesus died for our sins. And then it goes on to say this, that, that, that God made uh, us alive spiritually with him. God forgave us. Uh, Christ wiped out every single sin that we've ever committed against him. Jesus Christ nailed our sins to the cross. He was raised from the dead. So the word of God tells us that our sins are absolutely forgiven. But now listen to this. In Colossians 2.16, this is what God's word says now. This is the New Testament. Let no one judge you in food. Or in drink, or regarding a festival, or a new moon, or Sabbaths. Don't let anybody try to trip trap you. Don't let anybody try to say, hey, listen, you know, if you eat this kind of food, God's not going to accept you. Well, the Bible says that all food has been declared as clean if we receive it with thanksgiving and prayer. For by prayer it's sanctified. Amen? God blesses that. So God has declared all food as being clean. So it's getting into the mindset of, listen, you know, there's people that literally believe to this day that if you have girls and boys, all the girls got to sit on this side, all the boys got to sit on that side, they can't swim in the same pool together, they can't go to the same beach together because I mean, that would somehow, some way, uh, make them uh, not as righteous or as close to God. Listen, you are going to be as close to God as you possibly can the moment that you get saved. It's not based on what you eat. The Bible says it's not what comes, it goes into a man that makes him unclean, but it's what comes out of a man's heart that makes him unclean. Amen? So we don't make ourselves acceptable to God by doing certain things, by following certain rituals. And so he's talking about the spirit of the law. Let no one judge you concerning Sabbath, plural there. Now, what are Sabbaths? Well, according to verse 17 of chapter number 2 of Colossians, it says this which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance of that shadow is Christ. So what the Old Testament, or what God is saying to us is, listen, the Sabbath had a spiritual significance. It carries a meaning with it that Christ himself fulfilled. Now, Paul said the Sabbaths were a shadow of things to come. 
Now, the Jews of the Old Testament, as I've already said, couldn't pick up sticks. They couldn't work. They couldn't do anything. You know why that God didn't want them to do that? Because God did not want them to work on that day because it was a picture of what Jesus Christ was ultimately going to do for us. In other words, you are not working for your salvation. Jesus Christ is going to come and do that work for you, and we are going to rest in Him. We are going to rest in His work. So it would distort the picture of how a person is saved. It would distort the picture of the whole reason why Jesus came. Paul said the substance that made that shadow, the shadow of the Sabbath, the shadow of rest, if you will, was Christ. So there's a spiritual meaning to this. Now, people insist on saying that you must keep the Sabbath days. I'll tell them you're chasing shadows. Paul was saying this, listen, eternal Sabbath. The word Sabbath literally means rest. So eternal rest for the Christian is not found in a period of time. Eternal rest for a Christian is not found in a place. Eternal rest for a Christian is found in a, in a person and his name is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our rest. Jesus Christ is our eternal Sabbath, our eternal rest. We rest in him. Amen? Are you with me? So, that is why we worship one of the reasons why we worship on Sunday, the Lord's Day, and not on Saturday, are the Jewish Sabbath. Christ fulfilled all the requirements of what the Sabbath demanded in the Old Testament by His death, by His resurrection, and by the fact that He is seated on the right hand of God. Now, in the New Testament, we worship on the first day of the week. Do you realize that Sunday literally is the first day of the week? It's not Monday. It's actually Sunday. We worship on Sunday. Why do we worship on Sunday, Brother Dave? Now, instead of Saturday. Well, let's answer that question. Listen, the Sabbath, according to Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, all the way down to verse 11, was written primarily to the Jews. And again, their Sabbath was on Saturday. Now, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 31, verse 12 and 13, listen, the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak also to the children of Israel. Who? The children of, are, are we Israel? We're Gentiles, amen? So he's speaking directly to who? To the Israelites, amen? Now listen, all of the Bible wasn't written to us, but all of the Bible applies to us, amen? He wrote this specifically for the Jews. And this is what he said. Also to the children of Israel saying, My Sabbath, you shall keep it a sign between me and you throughout your generation. So the Sabbath was a covenant day that God gave exclusively to Israel. Now Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 12 says this, speaking of the Jews. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between them and me that, I might, that, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. So God never intended for the church to worship him on Saturday, but God intended for the church to worship him on, on Sunday. Now, this commandment, again, is the only commandment that is not carried over to the New Testament, but the principle of this commandment is. Are you listening now? Why? Why Sunday, Brother Dave? Well, God the Father finished his work of creation on the last day of the week. That was Saturday. Jesus Christ, his Son, finished the ultimate work of salvation on Sunday, the first day of the week. Amen? Are you with me? That's a question. Okay, good. All right. I want to make sure. My wife says I'm a fire hydrant when I speak sometimes, and I don't want to, I don't want to flood you. Amen? Now, in the Old Testament, the, the, the Jews celebrated God's work of creation. They celebrated the fact that he made all that he did, and he rested from it. But in the New Testament, we celebrate the new work of salvation. Let me give you some reasons and principles found in the New Testament of why it is the Lord has set aside Sunday to worship Him. You know, guys, it wasn't something that a group of people got together back in the 1800s and said, hey, you know, i got a great idea. Hey, let's worship the Lord on Sunday. No. God's Word, in principle, instructs us that Sunday is the day that He has chosen Himself by the example that He left for us. Jesus was raised from the dead on the first day of the week, according to Matthew 28, verse 1. That was on Sunday. The Bible, completion of the Bible, started on the first day of the week, according to Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, on the Lord's day. And Jesus gave John 
John, his disciple, the revelation, or the whole book of Revelation, and that was on the first day of the week. The Holy Spirit was given on the first day of the week at Pentecost. That's Acts chapter 2. The early church worshipped the Lord on the first day of the week. The apostles included, according to Acts chapter 20, verse 6 and 7. And the church took up offerings on the first day of the week, according to 1 Corinthians 16, verse number 2. So, in other words, the seventh day, Saturday, in the Old Testament, it celebrates creation. That's what they create. God's physical work of creation. But the Lord's day celebrates the beginning of spiritual life. Salvation. Amen. The Sabbath day, Saturday, celebrates our life in Adam. But the Lord's Day, Sunday, celebrates our new life in the second Adam, and that is Jesus Christ himself and the finished work of salvation. The Sabbath was a day under the law. But the Lord's Day, Sunday, is a day that is under grace. Amen. The Sabbath day celebrates the work of God's hand. But the Lord's Day celebrates God's heart. Amen? For all of mankind. Sunday is not the week's end. Saturday is. But Sunday is the first day of the week. So we start our week out with God. The Bible says, in the beginning, God. That's a good way to start your day. That's a good way to start everything that you do. Amen? In the beginning, with God. So the early Christians started their weekday by preaching, by praying, by proclaiming God's word, worshiping, fellowshipping with one another. So Sunday is not just a day of rest, but it's also a day of worship and remembrance for the Lord, who He is, and what He's done for your heart, and what He's done for your life. Amen? Amen. So the word there in verse 8 of Exodus 20, the word remember, God gives each and every one of us a warning. Be warned that a life that majors too much in work will be minus in worship. A life that majors too much in leisure will be minus in worship. We have to have a balance. Amen? Hmm. God's two great principles that have been set by God himself because God did both. He rested. He finished. But he also worked. And then he tells us that we need to follow him. We need to follow these principles that he's laid for us for resting ourselves and working for the Lord. So if you're the person that's a workaholic and you think everybody should be like you... And you have the attitude that I can never relax, I can't do this, I can't do that. Listen, man, you're going to have a cold spiritual life. Amen? Boy, you reap what you sow. God is not mocked, the Bible says. You know, you can reap a cold marriage if you work all day long. If you don't ever spend time with your wife or your, your other significant, you're, you're not going to be as close as you need to be. Amen? And there's an old saying, man, if you let the fire go out, the wolves come. But the fire go out of your marriage, man, the wolves come. So we have to work, amen? Boy, you'll suffer spiritually, mentally, emotionally. Uh, they're, they're even saying now that people that don't get rest and don't take proper rest, there's actually an enzyme that slowly begins to eat at your brain. And I was thinking, well, that's what's wrong with me, amen? <laughs> Boy, wow. You know, who, who, who knows about that? But, 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 but if, it, if it's there, I, I, I would agree with it because you can't go against God's principle and win. You can't sin and win, amen? God won't let you. Hmm. So, God says that work is blessed. God says that leisure in its proper context is blessed. So there's nothing wrong with taking a vacation. There's nothing wrong with doing any of those things. So in other words, God is the God of balance, and he has set forth both of these principles in the Bible for us. Now, the Sabbath day, if you don't mind, the Sabbath day wasn't a burden, if you will, to Israel. For some of them it was because they wanted to make money. They wanted to keep working and not honor what God said. But the psalmist said this, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Are you glad that you are able to come to the house of the Lord to hear the word of God preached? Yeah. Amen. So, God finished the work of creation. Jesus Christ, God's son, finished the work of salvation. And if you'll just let me Wrap this up. Let's look quickly at God's work, the Holy Spirit's work of regeneration, redemption. Now, there's two ways that you can rest. You can rest from something. I'm not going to cut the grass. I'm not going to do the dishes. I'm going to rest from doing that. Or you can rest in something. You can rest in your bed. Amen? But now listen. God rested from his work of creation. Jesus rested from his work of salvation. But now the Holy Spirit tells us as Christians that we are to rest 
in his work of regeneration. You see, you and I can't live the Christian life. Jesus Christ in us and through us lives the life that we can't live. So when you read about Jesus walking down the dusty roads of Jerusalem, and when you see how Jesus interacts, you see what Jesus says, you see how Jesus responds to people when you read about what he did. Listen, Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And guess what? That same Jesus lives in you. And so he's going to respond, he's going to react the same exact way that he did, but he's going to do that in you and through you and live the life that you and I can't live. So we are to rest in him. We're to allow his life to be lived through our lives. Are you with me? Now, I, I can't play this piano like, like Miss Shirley does. Absolutely not. If I were to set a glove on this piano, that glove would just sit there dead. Amen? But now, if you take her hand and put it in that glove, that glove's going to play this piano very, very nicely. Amen? But now, is it the glove playing the piano, or is it her playing it? Well, in the same way, is it Dave Unger living the Christian life? No, it's Christ in me. There is no good in me at all, and any good that anybody ever says is in Dave Unger is in the Lord. Amen? So he lives his life in and through us, and God tells us that we're to rest in him. Now, have you ever seen a fruit tree? Raise your hand. Now, have you ever seen a fruit tree grunt to grow fruit and pop out fruit? I mean, it's just shaking its limbs. Boom, and it pops out that fruit. Is that how it pops out fruit? No, man, it rests in the what? The vine. Amen. When I was trying to teach my kids how to swim, I said, just stop. The water will hold you up. You just got to trust it. With that struggle, it made them what? Sink. But as soon as they rested, boy, they would float. In the same way, God says, listen, I'm living my life in you. Remember, it's the great exchange. I'm living the life that you can't live. We've proven that already. God says, for all have what? <laughs> Sin. Amen? So we can't live the life that God expects us to, but Christ in us can, and he makes us righteous. He gave us as a gift his perfect righteousness so that we no longer have to do this or eat certain meats, abstain from certain things, obey this and obey that, because the law was never given to cleanse a man or a woman's soul. It was given to show us that we're guilty and that we're sinners. Amen? Amen. If you go in your bathroom and you look at your mirror, and on the mirror you look into it, and it shows that you're dirty. Do you take the mirror off your wall and clean yourself with it? It's not designed to do that. Amen? God's law is not designed to cleanse your soul. It's to show you that you are guilty, that you've committed crimes against the Lord. You're on your way to hell. And as you look into the law of God's mirror, when I look at my mirror, I see the reflection of my shower. And that mirror is saying, hey, bud, you're filthy, you stink, take a shower. Well, when you look into God's law, it says, hey, listen, you need to go to Calvary. You need to go to Jesus Christ to cleanse your soul and to get the rest that you need. Amen? Are you with me, church? All right. So, when people ask you, why don't you keep the Sabbath anymore? Or why don't you worship just on Saturday anymore? You can say, listen, I keep the Sabbath every day of the week. Why? Because my Sabbath, truly, in principle, according to the Word of God, is not in a period of time. It's not on a certain day. It's not done in a certain place. It's in a person that lives within me. That promised me he'll never leave me nor forsake me. Amen? He is... Our eternal rest, our eternal Sabbath. But yes, practically, in principle, we worship on Sunday because of the Lord's example that he's gave to us. Amen? So, Jesus is my rest. There is nothing else. There's no place. There's no period of time. He is the perfect person that we rest in. Amen? So in the Old Testament, there was six days of work and one day of rest. But in the New Testament, the first day is for rest, but the next six days are for work. Now, isn't that interesting? I don't work for my salvation, but I rest in it after I have it. Amen? I rest in my salvation, and I work because of my salvation, but I never work for my salvation. Are you with me? Yes. So I'm not working to get or earn eternal life. That's already been attained for me by the work that Jesus himself did. Listen to Hebrews 4, 9, and 10. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest as himself also ceased from his work as God did from his. So you and I can never work for our salvation. We need to quit trying, and we need to really truly preach what Jesus says, and that is trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Amen? And who he is and what he's done. 
Wow. Um, let me give you one other thing here, and maybe to just kind of help lay the picture out, and then I'm going to close. All right? Well, you know what? I, I think I've said enough. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> land that plane, preacher. Land it, brother. Land it. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. As we come, we're going to have a, a, a song of invitation. So just shortly after I pray, we're going to stand. Let me just ask you this, church, as we take this moment to be in the presence of the Lord in prayer. If God has spoken to you in any way tonight, I just want you to say, Lord, thank you so much for speaking to me tonight. And then what I want you to do is if you're able, if you want to come, use this altar, or you can use your pew. But just say, Lord, I need you to supernaturally in me and through me do what it is that you're asking me to do. And then number three, I just want you to take some, take some time and just thank God for his love. Thank God for the fact that he never leaves you nor forsakes you. That he loves you with all of his heart. And that he's with you every single step of the way, no matter what it is you're facing, no matter what it is that you're going through. And the Lord is there. Amen. Amen. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, 16, let us come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy to find grace in our time of need. So God says come boldly. When do we need God the most? When we're in sin. And yet he still tells his children to come boldly into the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy, that you may obtain grace in your time of need. So there's never a time that God doesn't want to hear from your heart. Amen? And if you're lost tonight and God's revealed to you that you need to truly repent of your sin and turn from sin and self and truly give your heart and life to the Lord and believe in your heart that God sent his son. Believe in your heart that God allowed all of your sin to be placed upon him, that he died in your place, he was punished in your place. Believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead, if God has led you to call out to him for real salvation, to be saved, to have eternal life, no one looking around, I just want you to say, Brother Dave, I, I believe God is telling me I need to be saved tonight. Just simply raise your hand. Anybody at all say, Brother Dave, I, I want to be led in the sinner's prayer so that I can be saved. Anybody at all? All right, church, if you'll stand to your feet, we're going to have one stanza. These altars are open. If you want me to pray with you, I'll be here as well. But whatever God's put in your heart, please don't leave this church not doing whatever God it is that God has told you to do.